Now I would like to introduce um, our speaker for today. Um, she trained in Edinburgh and Newcastle. Cambridge. Sorry. Cambridge. Cambridge and Newcastle, forgive me. Um, she is um, Professor of Infectious Diseases Epidemiology at University College. She's chair of the UCL Grand Challenge of Global Health and chair of the UCL Population Health Domain. She's had a stellar career, um, been members, a member of many, many committees and worked um, on uh, many boards. Um, in 2011, she was appointed a, a, a governor of the Wellcome Trust. And last year, she was made Dame Commander of the British Empire in the 2013 Queen's Birthday Honor List. Professor Anne Johnson. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Nice to see you um, uh, here today. I'm going to be talking about a study I've been involved in almost since I first came to UCL 29 years ago. Um, and that has been the study of uh, National Survey of Sexual Attitudes and Lifestyles, which is now in its third uh, iteration. And the results of the survey were published just before Christmas last year. And I'm just going to tell you something about the history of the survey and some of the new results that came out in the last survey. You might be interested to see how teams grow. Uh, this is the first survey in 1990, the second one in 2000, and the third one in 2010. It's involved an enormous a number of people, 45,000 particip participants, and 1,500 interviewers. And you can see that the team has grown, and we've indeed got more sort of cheered up over the years. Um, and you can see we're actually beginning to smile by the third survey. But it is a large team of people from UCL, uh, the Public Health England, from the School of Hygiene around the corner, and the research <coughs> work itself, the field work is done by the National Centre for Social Research. I got into this whole field of studying sexual behaviour after the advent of the HIV epidemic. Um, some of you may not remember that, but I certainly remember it very well. It was very frightening emergence of a disease of unknown cause, which was killing young men, uh, particularly young gay men, in London, in San Francisco, and then it was identified as a heterosexual epidemic, primarily in sub-Saharan Africa. And I started working on this epidemic in around about 1985. In the bottom right-hand corner here is a picture of Princess Diana opening the ward that we opened. It was my first job at UCL, actually. It was then the Middlesex Hospital Medical School. And my job was to design the ward for people who were dying of AIDS. There was tremendous fear of contagion, that is, of casual transmission of HIV. And this iconic photograph of Princess Diana me is a reminder of the fear and stigma around AIDS, which she did a great deal to allay by shaking hands with a patient with AIDS when the ward was opened. But you'll see he has his head to the camera, you can't see his face, because in those days it was just uh, far too much uh, for people to ever uh, publicly say that they had AIDS, there was so much stigma. And up on the top left-hand corner is Sir Donald Atchison, who really was a great uh, advocate for the prevention of HIV, recognising that we had in our midst a sexually transmitted infection. Nobody knew how far it was spread. And one of the reasons we didn't know how far it was spread is because we knew very little about patterns of sexual behaviour in the population. We knew the virus could be transmitted between men who had sex with men and heterosexually. But the extent of its transmission depended on parameters like the rate of sexual partner change in the population that we knew nothing about. And uh, it was at that time that we decided to try to do a representative sample of sexual behaviour in the population, not a magazine sample of volunteers, but a proper representative sample of the population. This uh, was really quite controversial at the time, because although we showed that not only were the population happy to participate in the surveys if they were done properly and the questions are asked confidentially and in clear formats, um, but we showed that the response rate was as high as any other areas of behavioural research. And although the, the study had been app uh, largely approved by, by uh, peer review bodies for funding, it was eventually 
uh, banned by uh, the then Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, who felt it wasn't an appropriate area for inquiry. Fortunately, the first study was funded in 1990 by the Wellcome Trust, and since that time we have gone on to do three surveys. So I wanted to give you a little history. Here is a little history of the three surveys. Um, the very first survey, which we carried out in 1990, involved 19,000 people aged 16 to 59. The second one, 12,000 people aged 16 to 44. And the current one, uh, 15,000 people aged 16 to 74. And you can see that we've kind of got braver as we've got older. <laughs> and um, this time, much to the horror of uh, large components, I think, of teenage population, we interviewed people over 50 about their sex lives. Uh, and uh, we have uh, always collected the, the data by questionnaire using self-completion pen and paper questionnaires, but moving in, in 2000 to computer-assisted interviewing, which we were able to demonstrate, got, got us both more complete data, but also uh, more, um, more reliable data. And more recently, in the last two surveys, we've been collecting biological samples to test for sexually transmitted infections, and more recently for testosterone. But I emphasize to you that all three surveys are probability sample surveys, that is, they're random samples on, based on the post office address file as the sampling frame and aim to be representative of the resident population in Britain. <coughs> I'm, going to be, excuse me, I'm going to be using data today from all three of the NatSAL surveys. And what I'm showing here is the kind of age range. The, this is the age range of each of the three surveys. But it covers, this shows you the birth year of the respondents who put, to, participated. The point of this is that we have data from people born in the 1930s to people born in the, 19, uh, in the 1990s, looking back over 60 years, if you like, as a picture of how sexual lifestyles have changed. And amongst those who were aged 16 to 44 at the three interview phases, we're able to make comparisons between the three surveys to look at changes over time. It's interesting to think about those people who were born in the 1930s and 1940s and what a different sort of time period they lived through. And I thought you might be interested in this film, which comes from the UCL Film Society. Statistics show that the average UC student spends 0.629 hours a week on sex, 10 seconds a week on drugs, and 208.75 hours a week on academic study. We asked several students for their opinions. Do you think the students at University College are immoral? Well, that depends on what you define immorality as. I mean, if you say that 60% of the British students living together is immoral, well, I guess they are more immoral than other students in the States, for instance. Well, what do you think is immoral? Well, I think... Um, man's sort of indecency to other men is immoral. Things like using napalm in Vietnam or just fighting in Vietnam at all. I think um, human disrespect for other human beings is about the worst sin possible. As an engineer, would you say that engineers are more interested in alcohol than in sex? Well, I think really with most engineers it's more a case of one thing leads to another. Do you find that your sex life interferes with your academic studies? Um, no, I would say that the absence of it would hinder it and the presence promote it. Do you think that students in England are more immoral than students in China? Yes, definitely. I don't think you can uh, separate academic work from sex life. These are two very important aspects of a student's life. Obviously, sex is an important aspect of, um, of any person's life, and work is an important aspect of the student's life in particular. If you have a happy sex relationship with someone, you're obviously, your work is obviously going to benefit from this. Conversely, if you have a, a bad sex relationship, it's going to suffer. I think this is the, uh, the link between the two. But it's because the sex that causes the um, difference in, in study, you know. Uh, there's no problem where that's concerned. It's just the emotional entanglements that sort of come in with it. It's when you've got these that you get all frustrated and you can't do your work and things start to go wrong. Sex itself, I don't think it makes any difference to study if you've got it or if you haven't. Well, I wonder how much you feel um, life has changed since then. I was quite surprised to see that, having been in the in university in 1971. Of course, all that had stopped by then. Um, however, <laughs> you can see that it's very likely that there was indeed in the 60s a very large change in sexual behaviour that we've never been able to capture. One way that we can capture it is to look at how sexually transmitted disease incidents change. And this is a graph of the number of cases of gonorrhea 
in England and Wales reported since 1925. You can see the peak during the Second World War, the decline thereafter, and this huge increase in the number of cases which occurred during the late 1960s and 1970s. And though I think very often the reports we read in the media would suggest that somehow um, we are now living in the most uh, sexually active um, period of, of, the, of the last 50 years, that isn't necessarily the case. You can see that when AIDS came uh, on the horizon in 1980, Gonorrhea virtually disappeared as a disease in England and Wales, almost certainly, although we've never been able to capture it, as a result of reduced sexual risk behaviour in the population. And then following that, uh, increased again, but never to anything to like the levels of the 1970s. And remember that the first survey we carried out in 1990, probably at a time when sexual behaviour, risk behaviour, had reduced quite dramatically, uh, as a result of the HIV uh, epidemic. So I'd like you just to bear that in mind as I show you how things have changed over time. These are the results from the first survey published in 1992 in Nature. And you can see then that the main concerns of studying sexual behaviour and indeed the legitimisation of studying be sexual behaviour was in order for us to understand how far HIV might spread in Britain. A decade later, we had really been, uh, not only had we influenced policy in areas other than HIV, there had been a much greater concern to extend our areas of inquiry. So in, 19, in 2000 to 2001, we considered, uh, we considered issues in relation to teenage pregnancy, informed policy on HPV vaccination. And we did our first biological studies looking at the prevalence of chlamydia and uh, the uptake of sexual health services as well as contributing our data to HIV prevalence estimates and HIV testing policy. A decade later, I think we've extended our inquiries even further, and I'll be talking about some of our results, to include a broader range of sexually transmitted infections, but also to embrace the entire WHO concept of sexual health, which includes concepts about safe and planned pregnancy, avoidance of sexual violence, and sexual function, including the ability to uh, participate in um, an happy and fulfilling sexual relationships. And it's in that context that we've been able to extend the studies that were published um, uh, late last year. For those of you who are interested, the content of the Natsal questionnaire broadly is set out here. We ask about um, age at first sex, about numbers of partners, about homosexual and heterosexual sex, and some of the new areas we've looked at a non-volitional sex, unplanned pregnancy, sexual function and satisfaction, as well as uh, medical history to look at the relationship between sexual lifestyles and general health, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. We also included in our studies 4,500 samples from people aged 16 to 44 to test for a range of sexually transmitted infections. Now, I, some of you may have seen some of this coverage in the media. If you're interested, you can either read, about, read all about it in the, in the press, uh, press reports, or if you're really interested, you can read all about it in the six papers and on our website. Those papers are open access and published in The Lancet. I'll give you the web link later. But you can see that the press interpreted our results in all sorts of different ways, so I thought I'd try and give you some of the facts. Um, here's a paper by, led by Kath Mercer, which was the first of the Lancet series which we published at the end of last year on changes in sexual attitudes and lifestyles in Britain over the last uh, 60 or so years. And here are some of the key findings. The way we live our sex lives has really changed quite dramatically. Um, these are people reporting their age at first heterosexual intercourse by age group. And you can see that older people who would have been born in the 1930s and 40s had their first, the men had their first uh, sexual debut around the age of uh, 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 18, declining now to uh, a median age of 16. And for women, the median was a little bit higher um, uh, 60 years ago, but has declined to be of a similar level, a median age of 16. And this is a median, remember, so 50% of, the, of, of the, the population um, report um, uh, uh, having sex before their 17th birthday, uh, and, the, and, and overall there's been a decline in that figure. And you can see if we look at the proportion having sex under the age of 16, 
there's again, and plot this by age, the proportion of people having sex under the, under the age of 16 increased, um, uh, has increased quite markedly. But perhaps the biggest uh, difference now is that amongst the 65 to 74 year olds, the men were much more likely to have had sex before 16 than the women, but now the uh, prevalences are more or less equal at around about a quarter of men and uh, a quarter of women, aged 16 to 24. These changes in earlier sexual debut um, also relate to a whole other areas, uh, differences in way we live our lives. Here I've plotted, not, plotted people not by their um, uh, current age, but by their year of birth. So we can look back over all the surveys and we can see that the age at first sexual intercourse has declined, as, I've t uh, as I showed you earlier, while the age at first cohabitation has increased and the age at first child has increased. So that the gap between having um, your first sexual debut and your first child has really widened enormously, as has the gap between age at first in intercourse and first co cohabitation. Meaning that we have kind of different needs in terms of our sexual health, Firstly, for protection from, from uh, sexually transmitted infection because of higher rates of partner change, but also because we need contraception for longer periods of our lives when people are often now delaying childbirth uh, and they're in particularly women in much more involved in the workplace, having careers and so on. So this has major implications for the services that we provide. If I turn to how sexual behaviour itself has changed over that time course, remember people starting to have sex earlier, changing partners more uh, frequently than, than they did um, a generation ago, we can look, begin to look at the changes bet in the last, uh, between the last three surveys in 1990 and 2000. And we're now comparing people aged 16 to 44 in the, th in the, the two surveys in 1990 and 2000. I showed you in my earlier slide how gonorrhea had disappeared in the 1980s due to behaviour change. So in 1990, we were kind of measuring at a low point in, um, a, a low point in terms of uh, sexual risk-taking. So between 1990 and 2000, we were initially, but subsequently perhaps not so surprised when we thought about the impact of the AIDS epidemic, that actually people had increased the reported number of sexual partners. So the people reporting 10 or more partners amongst men and women had increased. The people reporting two or more partners in the last year had increased. The proportion of men paying for sex had increased. And the proportion of men and women reporting having same-sex experience or partners had all increased. That was entirely consistent with what we observed in terms of the <coughs> beginning resurgence of new sexually transmitted infections. But the story between 2000 and 2010 is rather different. I've now added to this slide the blue line, which is the latest data from the 2010 survey, which shows that in terms of reporting partner numbers, the number of men uh, reporting 10 or more partners hasn't changed. There's been a small decline in those reporting two or more partners in the last year. No change in the proportion of reporting paying for sex and no change in those reporting same-sex experience or partners. So a very different story from that between 1990 and 2000. So the levels of activity we observed in 2000s have essentially been maintained at similar levels. Amongst women, however, we did see differences with some evidence of women reporting an increased number of lifetime partners. But the most striking difference was that in the proportion of women who said that they reported having same-sex experience ever um, or, or having had a same-sex partner ever or a sex partner, same-sex partner in the last five years. And this was really quite a marked difference. And we, uh, there was a lot of discussion about this in the press. A lot of the women who report same-sex experience, however, are not reporting exclusively same-sex experience. They report both heterosexual and homosexual partners, in fact, predominantly um, heterosexual partners. At the same time, though, over the three surveys, we've seen remarkably changing attitudes, in, uh, remarkable changes in sexual attitudes. If you go back to that film in, the 1960, in 1968, it would be interesting to reflect on how sexual attitudes may or may not have changed since that time. There was a bit of a sort of anything goes feel about, about that era. 
it's interestingly, I think, to reflect on some of, some of the anything things that were going on in view of some of the discussion about um, sexual violence and so on uh, that's been in the papers recently. So it's interesting to look at how our attitudes have changed, at least between the three surveys in 1990, 2000 and 2010. First of all, we've seen a much greater, if you like, acceptance of same-sex partnerships. Remember that um, uh, uh, homosexuality in men was only decriminalised in the late 1960s. Remember the picture I showed you of Princess Diana shaking the hands of a, uh, um, an a, a patient with AIDS and the stigma that there was towards people who were in same-sex partnerships. We've seen really a, much, a really changing view in society and acceptance of same-sex partner, partnership. However, interestingly, uh, the number of people who think that one-night stands are not wrong at all is actually rather small and has not changed in the last 10 years. On the other hand, the proportion of people who think non-exclusivity in marriage is always wrong has actually, in, has actually increased, suggesting perhaps that it's difficult to interpret this, that we're beginning to sort of rethink um, the kind of partnerships we have and the relationships that we, that we have them in and consider not only the quality of the relationship with the person we have the relationship in, but also the harm that that may or may not do to others. So you could say we've become more accepting of diversity, but um, uh, uh, less tolerant of anything which we feel may be disrespectful to others. So three take-home messages on change over time. There's been a huge change in sexual attitudes and lifestyles over the last 60 years. Recent changes in behaviour are much more marked amongst men than women, and unlike 60 years ago, women's and men's sexual lifestyles seem to be uh, more similar than they were uh, 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 over that time, I think reflecting the changing role of women's society. And we, while we're more accepting of diverse sexual lifestyles, we're perhaps more intolerant of disrespectful sexual partnerships. So I want to then move on to a, a second topic which we looked at in the survey, which was that of the relationship between our general health and sexual lifestyles. We were able to do this this time because we had many older people in our survey who, as we know, as you get older, unfortunately, you tend to be uh, more likely to be in ill health. And um, uh, uh, so we were interested in the relationship between general health, disability, uh, physical function, and specific conditions like cardiovascular disease and people's sexual activity. So perhaps... Um, this won't surprise you to know that as people get older, they are less likely to have had recent sexual activity, and that declines for men. It also declines for women, that is the, uh, uh, and more markedly for women than men, um, uh, partly because um, women are less likely to have a live-in partner by the time they reach their 50s and 60s. Men are much more likely to be in a partnership at that stage. Um, because they're more likely to repartner if they're separated through wid a widowhood separation um, or divorce. But what you can see is that throughout the life course, whether you're 24 or whether you're 64, if you report fair, bad or very bad health, you're less likely to have had recent sexual activity. And I think we often think of, um, uh, when we think about ill health in clinical practice, we often think about people's lifestyles in relation to smoking, alcohol and diet, but we seldom consider the impact of ill health on people's sexual satisfaction and sexual, uh, sexual lives. So we were able to analyse this in detail if, in this paper, if you're interested in going back to it, it was led by Nigel Field. And unlike, um, you might have think, people might say, oh, well, if you're very ill, why would you care about your sex life? But in fact, a large proportion of people, when asked uh, whether they had a a health condition that affected their sex life or their enjoyment, uh, a large proportion of people did feel that their health affected their sex, their sex life. This increased, perhaps unsurprisingly, um, with age, uh, but that increase in age was more marked in men than it was in women. And yet, although one in six people said that they had um, a, a, a health condition that affected their sex life, only uh, a quarter or less than a quarter of them had actually sought help or advice from a healthcare professional. And perhaps that reflects people's 
uh, feeling that this isn't an area that they can necessarily um, seek help on. So we have made, um, as part of our discussion of this paper, um, the observation that general health and sexual health matters to people right across their life course. It isn't just something for young people. And that sexual health advice should be a component of holistic health care and that future health and planning of sexual health services need to consider relevant sexual health concerns at all ages. A new area for us too was non-volitional sex. This is work led by Wendy McDowell at the School of Hygiene. And the question wording, because this is rather important of what we asked, was we asked, has anyone tried to make you have sex with them against your will and has anyone actually made you have sex with them? The question was in relation to having sex since the age of 13 years and it was asked again in the self-completion section and asked of both women and men. Many studies have actually not looked at uh, both men and women in these surveys. And the results we got were here. The screening question, as anyone attempted, was, was, um, uh, was asked as a screening question and then followed by a qu question about completed non-volitional sex. And you can see that 9.8% of women reported completed non-volitional sex and 1.4% of men. I think we obviously this question may have captured a large variety of different experiences but what was really of interest was that whatever age people were at whether they were now 65 to 74 or whether they were now 16 to 24 the median age at which this occurred is young at 18 years for women and 16 years for men and we were asking them about the last experience so many people were talking about something that happened many years ago. So although I think there are concerns about increased rates of non-volitional sex, it's very apparent that this has been a problem for generations. And what we're seeing discussed now in, in, in public discourse really relates to a problem that has remained hidden, I think, for many years. And this slide perhaps demonstrates how hidden that is. This is, this is people, whether or not, when they'd experienced non-volitional sex, whether or not they'd told anyone. And you can see that in green is all the people who told no one at all. In blue is the small proportion who told the police. Now, um, and, and the rest who'd, um, who told someone, but not the police. What I think is evident is that um, um, at least some sense that at least this is more, coming out more in the open is that it's the youngest people are more likely to have talked to somebody about it. It's much more likely to have been a hidden experience amongst older people. But clearly the most important thing in this area of non-volitional sex is the importance for early intervention and prevention um, and then targeted intervention for those who are most vulnerable, integrated services and really I think um, the ability for people to be able to access a range of services and um, to really open up this area for discussion and support but primarily, of course, to uh, prevent um, uh, uh, sex against people's will. This is um, how the independent uh, expressed some of our research. So the last topic that I'd like to talk about uh, in the survey today is about sexually transmitted infections. I said that the survey has informed policy on sexually transmitted infections, and I just show you some of the data which arose from the studies we did testing urine samples for a range of um, sexually transmitted infections. The most prevalent um, infection is high-risk human papillomavirus. This is the virus which uh, causes cervical cancer and is recognized also in causing some other cancers. And you can see that this was present in 15.9% uh, of samples in, in women, 8.4% in men, or we know the test isn't quite as uh, sensitive, so this is probably an underestimate. Chlamydia, which is an infection which many of you may be familiar with, and it's certainly in 16 to 24 year olds, may have taken advantages of the National Chlamydia Screening Program, where people can get routinely tested, was around 1.5% of men and 1.1% of women. HIV, much more rare, um, one in a thousand, and gonorrhea, uh, less than one in a thousand. I think I showed you the earlier graphs of the gonorrhea curve. It'd be interesting to know what this would have looked like had we been able to do this test in the 1970s. Much less gonorrhea now, ar around now. People were concerned that there might be a lot of missed infection, but we found no evidence of that. <laughs> 
So for those, of course, the whole point about sexually transmitted infections is that the risk of acquiring an infection increases with increasing numbers of partners. And indeed, we found this so that with people with this is showing um, the proportion of people with chlamydia, if they had three or more partners, their risk of having chlamydia rose to 4%. Remember, the overall risk was 1.5%. The risk rises to 4% of the population. But we also show in these pictures the size of the population with that behavioral characteristic. So you can see that the proportion of people with one partner in the last year is much larger than in the, if you take it, the number of people in the population with one partner is much larger than the, the number of people with three partners. So while at an individual level, if you have multiple partners you, in the last year, you might be at higher risk of having chlamydia, a lot of the chlamydia in the population overall um, occurs in people who've only had one partner in the last year. So for example, in the chlamydia that we diagnosed, 60% of it was in women who've only had one partner in the last year. Some uh, evidence now that the HPV 1618 program, which is a vaccination program to prevent cervical cancer for young women, is beginning to have effect. These are the very earliest results. It's rather kind of wonderful that for my generation, the big public health intervention for cervical cancer was the introduction of the cervical screening program to prevent people um, to get early detection of abnormalities um, uh, suggestive of cervical cancer. Now, the latest generation of young women can have a vaccine which will prevent them getting the virus that causes cervical cancer. And these are the first data from the very first women who were not vaccinated in school but were offered vaccination through a catch-up program. And we were able to show early signs of reduction in HPV 16 to 18 prevalence in that group. So I hope when we do this 10 years later, the impact will be even greater. We were also able to show how much public health programs have been increasingly taken up by current generations so that the number of people being tested for HIV between the three surveys here, one, two, and three, have markedly increased, particularly over the last decade. And that is entirely consistent with the government's sexual health program to increase access to sexual health services. Many public health programs instead of reaching those people who most need them, reach the worried well. It's very gratifying to know that actually it was the people who were at greatest risk of, um, of, uh, of, of um, having HIV who are most likely to, to test. That is, for example, men who've had sex with men in, the, in, the, in this group here. You can see this um, group here in orange and those um, uh, uh, who have attended a sexual health clinic. So it's those at greatest risk who are more likely to be tested. And similarly, since the introduction of um, the open access, broader sexual health services, we've all see, also seen a great increase in uptake of those services, again, amongst those people with the highest numbers of partners. So here, you can see that those with 10 or more partners are much more likely to attend and take uh, cognizance of the services, as is true for chlamydia. So there's still a lot to be done in the control of STIs through infection-specific interventions. But the final word I give to The Lancet, who said that um, they recognised that our sexual health services had to embrace more than simply STIs and HIV, and called on the UK government to initiate a review of sexual health services, concluding that the pre present arrangements for delivering sexual health services may be severely deficient. And if any of you are interested in uh, finding more of these data, they're all available on an open access website at natsal.ac.uk. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have um, a couple of minutes for questions. Do we have any questions? Yes, we have one here. Um, Mike is just coming to you. Um, Hello, I wanted to know if you have an opinion about um, making sex education part of the national curriculum, because I believe the House of Lords will be debating this on next Wednesday. Um, my own view is that um, uh, as a sex education in schools is extraordinarily important, but it should not be limited to just biology and, and 
the biology of sex. I think the evidence is that uh, it needs to be part of a broader uh, concept of, of relationship education, but also needs to include a kind of joined up approach, which means that uh, young people and indeed um, in schools and, and children do get appropriate, age appropriate education um, through, their, through, their, through their school years. But as they get older, they need also to be able to link into the kind of services I've been talking about. Access to contraception services is hugely important for young people to prevent unwanted pregnancy. Obviously, the kind of access to services in relation to non... We're talking about um, pressure for people to have sex. Those kind of things are very important. So, yes, I do think that we need to have much greater attention to having proper um, uh, uh, education in schools that's appropriate and also guided by young people's views on the subject. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, it looks as though you've answered all the questions. So it just leaves me to thank you once more. And I think everyone would like to join in with me in thanking you. Thank you. Thank you.